Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Manscaped has the revolutionary electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it's guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts or your chest because you can use it upstairs and downstairs. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. I have a wonderful guest for you guys today. But before I get to that, I just want to give a quick shout out to my sponsors, Adam and Eve. If you go to adameve.com and use code Holly, you will get 10 free gifts along with free shipping with your purchase. So make sure you go to adameve.com, use code Holly to get 10 free gifts plus free shipping. So my guest today is porn star, DJ, and my possible favorite title of all time, according to Wikipedia, the pioneer of pegging, Brittany Andrews. (laughs) So happy to be in the house. Finally, I've been uh, hoping to get on your show for a long time. So thank you for having me. No, of course. I've, I've, I've always wanted you to have to come on and, and we were kind of going over things before we started. I mean, you've, you are so many things and you do so many things and you have so many achievements that uh, there's so much to talk about. I fear that we may not even get to it all. (laughs) Um, But yeah, maybe let's start off a little bit with, tell me a little bit more about yourself. I know I gave you like three titles, but I know you're like more than that. You do, you do so much more. You're a director as well. So kind of give us a little bit more of a lowdown about Brittany Andrews. All right. Well, I'm an old bitch. Let's start off there. (laughs) But thank God porn has made old bitches to be trending. You know, hashtag (laughs) old bitches are trending. Yay. (laughs) When I'm an old bitch, they're trending. So I'm like super ecstatic about that because I remember being in the business when 30 much, when pretty much your, your career was over at the age of 30. It was before the word MILF existed. And right when I was about ready to leave, at the age of 30, that word had just came up. And um, none of us really knew how we felt about it. Little did I know that that one little word was going to allow me to have like another, God knows, 20, 30 years to my um, to my career. So I'm really uh, grateful. And it's funny too, because when all of my civilian like friends, when I'm always like, tell people your age, like, you know, old bitches are trending. (laughs) They're like, they are? I'm like, yes, thank porn. We've done it for you. Now it's cool to be on Tinder and say that you're 40, 50. So, um, but yeah, so besides being an old bitch, what am I? Um, I guess I'd like to call myself a Jill of all trades. Uh, You know, I'm um, a Jill of all trades, a master of none, but a mistress of a few, right? Um, So a little bit of everything. You know, I started off, producing and directing and porn at quite a young age. When I was like 22, I had a uh, 5,000 square foot studio downtown LA that I rented out uh, for about 13 years. That's Bella, one of my children. The other one's Mia, a cat. And, um, And yeah, I had that studio for like 13 years downtown LA. And so that's kind of where I started my, that's what I like to call my first film school was um, my studio downtown LA. Um, So then I did porn for like 15 years. Then I moved to New York and um, I went to film school for three years. And then I started doing mainstream film production. Uh, And then um, I won a bunch of awards. I had one of my films premiere at the Cannes Film Festival. I was in Sundance, the Toronto Film Festival, all these different things. And I guess on some level, I was like, okay, you know, like I've accomplished this. Stick a fork in it. I'm done. And then um, then I decided to go to music school in New York. And then I uh, got a master's certification in Ableton. And I started DJing and producing music. Um, and then recently, you know, I, I'm also a realtor. And then of course, 
let's not leave out the pioneer of pegging because that's let's not let's not let's not let's not leave that out let's not do that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Let's make sure we tackle that straight on. Um, but yeah, so I started my first series, um, Britney's Bitch Boys, before the word pegging even existed. It was on VHS. I know, we shouldn't even say What is word. that? Exactly, right? There were like these big tapes with like, yeah. So um, it was called Britney's Bitch Boys. And I still produce it. And I, I have it on my OnlyFans. And it's gone through many you know ebbs and flows of of what it is of manifestations and so it started off on vhs and then it moved to dvd and then you know the life has just continued and um you know on wikipedia it says me and francesca lee i think maybe there was one other person that was mentioned i can't remember but yeah so it was a back then it was just called female to male strap on And, you know, I used to have what was called the Niche Bitch Network, which was 30 different websites that I had that was like, you know, smoking, feed, lesbian, Asian, you know, it was before the word femdom existed too. So I was doing a lot of uh, femdom. I had one of the first ever financial domination websites too, Pay Miss Brittany. Uh, And that's like the weirdest thing is I really was a trendsetter in a lot of ways before VOD. Like they don't even call it VOD anymore. Sorry. <laughs> I get stuck in my age at times. <laughs> Digital distribution on all these different platforms. Um, I started kind of being a content creator before that concept even existed. So um, I was doing like segment producing for a Playboy TV back in the day and yeah, you know, I've had a very colorful career in life. And, you know, next year it'll be 30 years uh, since I first stepped into the adult entertainment industry. And, you know, I really, truly am so beyond grateful um, because it's given me such a blessed life. Um, I really couldn't have dreamed up of something like I'd have my own genie room when I'm 50. (laughs) You can't make that shit up, man. So, um, but no, truly, I've had a really good life. I've been able to travel all over the world. I've dated multi-billionaires. I've always been able to pay my own bills. I've been able to take care of my family, pay my taxes, even when I've been audited. So, you know, overall, I'm just uh, truly grateful for this ride, this journey. I mean, that's amazing. That's so many different things. I mean, obviously you've been an entrepreneur since the very beginning. So I feel like you're such a wonderful example as a foil to those people who say porn just victimizes women and it puts them in a place where they can never, you know, um, ever access any kind of other career path or do anything else with their lives. I mean, you're the, the antithesis to that to that idea. So what do you say to people like that who say that porn just victimizes women and ruins their lives? Because I feel like you're a great example of the opposite. Well, I do believe that you better be an entrepreneur if you are going to get into the adult entertainment industry, because it is going to be difficult to get a job. (laughs) <laughs> per se. You have to be a, you have to be able to create a new image, a new brand, a new career. Um and you can you 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 can't be working for somebody else per se. That can tell you whether or not you can make money. You have to be able to figure out ways like the DJ, the filmmaking, realtor, you know, all of those different things are kind of self-made type of paths that I chose specifically because yes, I am a porn star and that is going to be um, difficult. And even with some of those other things that I did, people were like, you know, as a mainstream film producer, they're like, Oh my God, do, do like people know. And I'm like, at the end of the day, independent filmmaking is a lot of work and it's really difficult. And if you do your job really well, no one gives a fuck. <laughs> what you did before, you know, as long as you can, you can get the job done. And as a porn star, I was able to pull extra resources out of my ass. <laughs> that maybe we, other, yeah, that yeah. maybe other producers couldn't do. I could say, Hey, I'm Brittany Andrews. Let me use your freaking nightclub, you know, or your restaurant. You know, I was able to 
you know, kind of get in there and get things done that maybe some other people couldn't do because I had a little bit more pull because of who I was. Um, and then the DJ thing, you know, um, it's difficult as a female, either which way. Um, so, but you know, I made the best out of that. I wanted to, um, take, I wanted to take it, I wanted to, it to take the place of feature dancing, which is what it did as I got older. Cause I got a bad back as most old bitches do. And, uh, <laughs> so I didn't want to be rolling all over the stage, but but to go back to the victimization thing, you know, I think every human being, both man and woman, once they get into this industry, they have to be uh, very, they have to have a conversation with themselves and say, what do I, what am I willing to do and what am I not willing to do? And if you start pushing boundaries that you're uncomfortable with, then you should step out. And, you know, I think it's really, you know, whenever I find like newer girls, I'm always, I tell them, I'm always here to help. You know, you've got my phone number, call me, text me. I'm always available. I'm always happy to like, you know, give any kind of mentorship because I really feel it's important in the beginning of your career to kind of start off right, because that's going to be the foundation of the rest of your career. And I really feel like if you get a good foundation, you know, that you can grow and have a really long, happy career. Now, of course, some people might get in because of, you know, whatever, some unfortunate circumstance that, you know, or they had, like they worked for a shitty company the first time and it triggered some kind of trauma that they may have had. And the whole thing started off on the wrong foot. Um, and I'm almost like, it might be best for you to just try something else and not continue because, you know, there are so many women in this business that I know that are my age that also are able to look back at their, uh, long career and to see how absolutely blessed they've been, uh, to have the kind of opportunities to live the kind of life that they've lived you know, to be able to take the money, invest it into other businesses. Um, but quite often, you know, those are not the stories that are told, you know, which is one of the things that I liked about um, working on After Porn Ends was they told the honest story. Some of them sucked and some of them were good. You know, mine was a good one, you know, then the next one next to me was not so good. But that's kind of life in any any human being. Not everybody's going to have a great path with whatever career that they choose. Um, but there are so many opportunities within this business. If you're a smart woman and you look at it as a business, you can consistently grow in so many different directions that it's like a plethora, a cornucopia <laughs> of opportunities that you can a dive por into. A pornocopia. A cornucopia, you know, because there's production and everything with production. You can get into lighting. You can get into makeup, uh, set design, wardrobe. You can go into the tech side of things. You can um, get into becoming a programmer. You can, you know, go into social media marketing. I mean, because you are running your own business from the beginning, um, you have to have all of, and even more so now than back then, but luckily I'd kind of started doing all my own stuff back then, but you have to, in today's world, in order to be um, a porn star, you have to know how to do all these different things, you know, do your own productions, promote yourself. And, you know, I've always been really good with my bookkeeping too. So I've always, you know, my CPA, oh Lord, <laughs> hired a specific bookkeeper just to deal with me because on my, you know, on my spreadsheets, my profit and loss sheets, my balance sheets, I have to, I have to have everything like color coded in a certain way. And I get in fights with people over spreadsheets, but yeah. <laughs> well, I use, I, I'm very particular about my bookkeeping as well. Um, do, I use QuickBooks, which I love. Yes. And I set it up in a way that I categorize everything very specifically so I can run profit and losses and, and see exactly where my money is going. And um, I love it when people kind of try to challenge me on like, oh, well, I didn't get paid for this. I'm like, Doo -doo! I'm like, know, you I can't call me on me. shit because I, I got I got records on everything. Exactly. I grab it right <laughs> off the spreadsheet and I copy it and I paste it into the text message. I'm like, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. I was like, and you, d- you received a check on this date and you exactly. deposited it on this date. So like, I'm get your shit together. I'm the same way, girlfriend. I get it. <laughs> and I can go back many years. I got everything oh, besides in QuickBooks. Everything. I got everything in my spreadsheets too. Cause, um, yeah. And I've got all my spreadsheets in one, so I don't have to look for another file. It goes all the way back to like 2000 and 14 or something. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, it only takes me seconds, bitch. You lie. But, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you, you really do have to be that organized with money. And, and like you were saying too, about, I, I do feel that porn kind of allows people to move between different roles more easily than in mainstream. Yeah. I think a part of it is because, you know, we don't have the big mainstream budgets, right? So like for me, I had to teach myself video. You know, I started off as just a photographer. I had to teach myself video. Um, and I've been teaching myself editing. And obviously I taught myself retouching. And, you know, there's so many different things that we have to be able to do in order to create content for the price that we create content for. But it also, you know, the more you know, the more independent you are and the more you can do for yourself. And and the more you can really take charge of your career. So I definitely hear you on all of that. Um, so I want to actually ask you, cause you mentioned about directing life after porn ends three, which I know is a very popular documentary series on Netflix. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of people expect to see, um, a documentary that paints people who were in porn in a, in a bad place now, because like I said earlier, people always expect that porn ruins their lives. And, and like you said, um, it definitely, it doesn't help some people. Um, some people don't have a great life after porn. Some people have a great life after porn like you have. Is there anything in particular that you learned from doing that documentary or were there any stories that stuck out to you um, in any way that really you found impactful? Well, you know, I really worked hard. Uh, Because I was not the producer, I was the director. Uh, So I was not in charge of the individuals that got onto the show, but I was um, uh, kind of talent scouting in the beginning, working with the producer of who we were going to have. And I really, really wanted Alexandra Silk and Luke Wilder on it. I've known them from the beginning and they're such an amazing couple. Do you know them? I know of them, but I don't know them. They're oh still God, together, you right? You so gotta have them on your show. Okay. You, it'll be the best conversation you've ever had. Okay. I'm gonna write that <laughs> so down. Because that's the thing about, you know, the documentary as well. It's like, yeah, she's popular, but is she really gonna give us a good story? You know, are people really uh, gonna be entertained by what this individual you know, has to say, um, oh, girl, sure I know all the time. Yeah. Yeah. People so, are like, interview this girl, interview this girl. And I'm like, ain't got nothing to say. <laughs> yeah. You don't, <laughs> no. I'm going to ruin, I'm going to ruin your like fantasy of her. You don't want me to. Yeah, exactly. Her, you know, echo in the bunny man or whatever. Right. But, yeah. um, So anyways, I knew that they are extremely compelling. They both have got like multiple PhDs in sexology and they finish each other's sentences and their dog was a part of the documentary as well. And, you know, and he is such an eloquent, articulate speaker and she's super adorable and really cute. And like I said, they finish each other's sentences and she's a surrogate sex worker as well, which there's only a few of them that, you know, it's a very particular practice uh, that takes a lot of years to be able to get to become one of those. And Can you explain what that is real quick? Because I'm not well, sure that I'm even familiar. Well, actually had a recent film about it too, but a like a medical psychological surrogate sex worker is uh, totally legal. And I actually used one myself. Um, mm-hmm. I had a psychologist when I was in New York that wanted me to work with a surrogate, which quite often they don't have a lot of people do that anymore because of malpractice and things like that. But he figured because I was a sex worker that we were kind of safe. But a lot of times it's individuals that are disabled uh, and like virgins, like older virgins and things like that, where um, it's actually like a medical profession to be a surrogate sex worker. And so it's actually an aspect of therapy. And it's 100% legal and it's certified and so forth and so on. So um, 
it really is, you know, a, a major aspect of therapy for some people to truly heal, you know, especially those of, that have had, you know, complex trauma uh, or, you know, just whatever it is that they're going through that they have a difficult time with touch and things like that. So truly amazing. And so, and then they had this series, um, it was like, I believe it was called Sex Across America from Adam and Eve. And so they had all this wonderful footage also to like add, you know, to bring more production value to the documentary of them having sex on like parachutes in Africa and on yachts and, you know, the South of France and all this other kind of stuff. And it ended the entire, the entire documentary on love and understanding. And like it, you walked away feeling full and complete and even spiritual. And, you know, we talked a lot about like sex worker rights within, you know, advocacy for sex worker rights without like shoving it down anybody's throat. But, you know, we had like little um, pieces of other porn stars in between the um, segments, the interview segments with the individuals that we were interviewing for the documentary. We had, you know, like at XBiz, you know, on the red carpet, little snippets from different porn stars and um, I believe it was Manuel Ferreira that was really talking about like some really good sex worker right type of stuff and a few other people as well. And so um, to be able to, it was that particular documentary, I believe it was like two years ago, was number one. It beat out that um, Sandra, uh, Sandra Bullock um, movie at that time. What was it? Bird Box or something? Oh, uh, where she's like blind and yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so, blinded with they kept cut their their eyes. Yeah, I yes. forgot what that was called, so but yeah, ours had at that point had beat hers, and we were number one on Netflix. And so to be able to have you know uh, sex worker advocacy inside of people's homes like that uh, truly makes me like a super happy person. So I'm I'm glad that I was able to participate in that. Yeah, I love that. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, I wanted to expand upon sex worker advocacy with SWAP and um, APAG. So hang on, guys. We'll be right back. Manscaped is here to help you level up your full body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it is guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts. And if you want to use it on your chest hair, it actually has different settings so you can get the perfect length, whether or not you're the kind of guy who likes to be a little bearish or maybe actually wants a bare chest, literally. You can get all of this inside the perfect package where you will find the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, as well as the crop reviver, a testy toner that is designed to give you a pep in your step. If you subscribe to the perfect package, you will get a blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. So what are you waiting for? Make this your best and most hairless summer ever. Go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Okay, so we're back. So, Brittany, can you explain to us um, about SWAP and what that means and what that is an acronym for and how you are involved in that? Sure. So SWAP stands for Sex Worker Advocacy Program. And, um, oh, sorry, Sex Worker Outreach Program. <laughs> I had the word advocacy in my head because we were talking about it. But um so there's a Swap USA, and then I believe there's something like maybe 30 different chapters within the United States that um, they um, are underneath the umbrella of Swap USA, who has got their board of directors. And for those that, oh, some people might know, some people might not know about 501c3s. So Swap USA holds the main 501c3. And then most of the chapters are underneath that umbrella. Some of the chapters have their own 501c3. So, and that's meaning just kind of non, like a tax filing. Non-profit. Yeah, yeah, it's a nonprofit organization. So, you know, one of the easiest, I brought my little 
my little flyers for them because it helps me be very articulate about what it is. So I'll just read it to you. So uh, SWAP, they deal with human rights, racial justice, economic equality, HIV modernization, modernization, LGBTQIA rights, criminal justice reform, mass incarceration, disability rights, human trafficking, labor rights, immigration reform, harm reduction, healthcare reform, and reproductive rights. So, and why does it deal with so many different things? Well, uh, racial justice, you know, there are a lot of marginalized sex workers. Uh, some of them are houseless and a lot of times swap like as somebody myself that's trying to be more involved with it, I understand that I am um, what would be considered like a privileged sex worker because of my color, my status. And so how can I use that for the greater good to help more marginalized uh, survival sex workers? So, um, you know, I came across, I've known about SWAP for a really, really long time. And I live here in Las Vegas, and they haven't had a swap uh, Las Vegas here for years. Uh, so I've been talking to one of the board of directors, uh, Alex Andrews, and she also um, is, I believe, the president of Swap Behind Bars. So Swap Behind Bars deals with um, sex workers that have been incarcerated. Um, and so I've been talking to her about perhaps starting a swap Las Vegas, but it is a really huge undertaking. So I'm slowly, you know, working on um, educating myself as much as possible on all of these various things, um, you know, because one of the things with Las Vegas that makes it very unique to other cities is a lot of our um, houseless population is in the tunnels. I'm not sure if you're familiar at all about the tunnels in Vegas. Oh, I am because I saw actually a girl that I used to work with, Jenny Lee, um, was there and they interviewed her and it was just so sad because I, I think I did one of her last shoots before she kind of disappeared and right. she was on, I mean, the drug problem was Heavy. was really difficult. And I almost, I don't really, I, despite what most people think, I don't encounter a ton of, of of girls on drugs where it's a real problem, but with her, it was a, it was a real issue. And, um, oh, I was so sad. And, you know, me having, you know, been through alcohol addiction and being sober, I, right. I tried to, you know, tell her that I, I would help in any way that I could. And if she ever wanted to talk about addiction and go to meetings and anything like that, anything like that, she just wasn't, she wasn't interested. Wasn't and then the next, yeah. next time I see her is being, is in the tunnels being interviewed and, I might end up oh. bumping into her. You don't know. <laughs> and I'll, so I'm also a sober woman. I think we've discussed this on social media uh, as well. So, and as part of like working a program and I've been doing a program for a long time, um, you know, the uh, one of the steps is to be of service. And I think, and I think a lot of us that are older, that have been around, that are still around, that have had such a blessed experience in this business, it's only natural that we want to give back in some kind of way. And, um, you know, I was kind of being asked to step up to this, um, this position to do the swap in Las Vegas. And I was like, Oh, it's going to be so much work. I don't know, you know, but I also kind of feel on some spiritual level. Um, however, it ends up manifesting. I'm already like kind of knee deep in everything um, that I feel it's like I'm a very spiritual person. And I like to call my, my universe, my mother got a she, you know, however, my mother got a she is going to have me walk through this. Um, I'm already started on this path and this journey and um, it's feeling very purposeful and really beautiful, even though it's really difficult to work at times. But so, yeah, so that's one of the obstacles in Las Vegas is all of the houseless are in tunnels. Uh, and with COVID, that's been, um, I've got two autoimmune diseases. And I don't like asking anybody else to do something that I'm not willing to do. But one of the um, main things um, as part of sex worker outreach program for marginalized home, uh, houseless sex workers is to, would be to go into the uh, tunnels and then hand out, um, you know, like bags that have got, you know, sanit uh, 
sanitizer in it, rubber gloves, and, um, you know, condoms, toiletries, maxi pads, tampons, like that whole kind of thing. Um, and then resources uh, as well, you know, getting them tested for HIV. Um, and then also giving them, you know, just different resources, drug and alcohol. Uh, and then, you know, being a non non judgmental human being that truly is just there, like to help. Uh, and so that's one aspect of it. And then the next one is, is swap has got a hotline, uh, where if you're a sex worker in crisis, you can call the hotline and then they, um, push the case management to whatever city is closest to where that actual sex worker is calling from. So in Las Vegas has got more sex workers than anywhere else in the United States. So um, manning that particular phone and case management uh, would also be one of the duties. And then, of course, you've got fundraising, which is another one, which is where I would be asking my other ladies that are uh, sex workers of priv uh, privilege to participate in some fundraising activities. And then, of course, decriminalization. Uh, that's like a really huge one. And then decriminalization, like as far as it goes on a national level, and then working with the law here within Nevada and Las Vegas and what we can do uh, to better serve the community of sex workers, which I would assume would be dealing with casinos and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the, the four, the way that I kind of look at what needs to be done. Uh, so it's not something you just jump into. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's like, oh, shit, I'll probably be doing this until I'm like 70 or something. But it's something that, you know, is spiritual, purposeful, uh, and means a lot because you're really, truly helping people. And I've already got some really amazing people to say that they would be on the board of directors for it. Uh, and I've been working on the the business plan and that whole kind of thing. So it's moving right along, you know, and, and of course, then you also do harm reduction too, which is interesting. I've taken a couple of harm reduction classes. So yeah, it's like a whole, whole new world. <laughs> so I just want to clarify for some people who, who don't necessarily know, cause I know that sometimes we fall into like sex work talk jargon and people right, exactly. who aren't in the industry are like, what did she mean? So when, when Brittany said decriminalization, she specifically means decriminalization of prostitution, which is different than legalization. And uh, we don't necessarily need to go into it now, but if you want to learn more about it, I actually had a wonderful interview with Alice Little. If you go back to uh, my podcast with her, she talks kind of extensively about the difference between the two. And so if you want to educate yourself on that, you can do that. Um, you mentioned harm reduction after yes. that. What specifically do you mean by harm reduction? So like... This is one of my other flyers that I brought for reference, uh, syringe access and the sex trade. So once again, when you would be going uh, and dealing with um, marginal, the marginalized sex worker community that's houseless, a lot of them um, might be participating in drugs and alcohol. So of course, um, I'm not here to judge. I'm only here to try to make sure that whatever you are doing, that you're supported and doing it in a way that's safe. So um, doing a needle exchange program, uh, addressing any kind of cuts that they might be having, any kind of abscesses, uh, handing out just different ways to make sure that if they do choose to continue to um, uh, uh, participate in their addiction, uh, that they're doing it in the safest way possible uh, for both themselves and the health of the community. So. Yeah. And that was something that I came up against as well when I was trying to get sober and really like struggling with it, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I just couldn't seem to actually like stop. And so my therapist was like, okay, let's, let's take a step back now and let's work on harm reduction. Let's work on right. maybe trying to drink in an environment where you know that you're not putting yourself in a situation where you're going to drive, or, you know, calling an Uber, or, um, a situation where people might take advantage of you. Like, knowing that you are going to drink and you're probably going to drink out of control. Let's, let's look at ways we can do this and so that, exactly. you know, you can be safe. So, and for me, that was just kind of like that first step that I needed to get me to a place where, you know, I was finally ready to get sober. Cause I'm sure, as you know, it's one of those things that it's, some people can just boom, go there. And <laughs> some of us, 
It, you know, it takes, we try for a long yeah, time. It takes us a long story. time to get there. Happened, uh, I've relapsed once so far, but. Um, yeah, same. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that sobriety is probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life is to get sober. Uh, well, not to get sober. Getting sober is really easy. Staying sober is the part that's really difficult. Yeah. And I know for myself, um, and that's one of the other things that I'm really passionate about is mental health within uh, the sex worker industry. The fact that they have um, pineapple support and, you know, there's different people that have different experiences with them. I've actively used their services. So I have my own experience with them um, as um as a sex worker that can utilize their services. Uh, the therapist that I'm seeing now is being paid for by Pineapple Support. I've um, participated in more than one of their group therapy support groups. Um, and I do that for multiple reasons. A, um, I could use more therapy. Who can't use more free therapy, right? A, all right. And then B, sorry, am I really loud on your ear? I know. No, my- no, no, my, my ear itches. <laughs> I'm a no, bitch. you're good. No, no, no. <laughs> Such an old bitch. I'm a loud bitch too. But um, but yeah. So I mean, I have two sisters that are schizophrenic, and one of them I've been her legal guardian uh, for like 16 years, and the other one ended up um, committing suicide. So I'm very, um, it's very personal. Like it's a personal issue to me that I care a lot about, and then also just being somebody that's been in this business for 30 years and seeing so many sex workers die. Right. And, and when I went to one, I went to a complex PTSD um, seminar uh, that Pineapple Support had at FetishCon uh, in Florida. And I saw the graphs of how many sex workers passed away in comparison to civilians. And the number was astonishing. And that really hit me really hard. You know, like it, it hurt my soul, especially because it was like after, you know, there's just been so, there was like a lot of deaths, like within the last couple of years, you know, and a lot of them, I knew there was that one well. year that we had yeah, so it was many just like one died. after another, after another. Yeah. And I think, you know, I saw that particular, I was in that particular um, seminar, like right around that time. And I mean, I really felt it. And so You know, I do a 12-step program for trauma myself. I've got complex PTSD. And as somebody that um, is sober, I've got sponsees. And I use my 12-step trauma program and my 12-step drug and alcohol program to try to further help. Because I think so many women um, have had trauma. I mean, we all know, like with rape and sexual abuse, almost, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but they're, you know. And when you're talking about people that have drug and alcohol issues that are women, I think most of them also have had some kind of uh, trauma to go hand in hand with that. So then they've got, you know, uh, an aspect of complex PTSD is to have the anxiety and the depression and all these other different things. So, um, you know, that's a really, for me, an important piece of all of this as well is making sure that, you know, individuals are getting proper mental health care. And so I'm consistently retweeting pineapple support and everything that they do. I even yesterday went to get on. They had something that they said was at 3 p.m. for some convention. I went on, but it was originally at like 7 a.m. because it's like in Berlin or something. And I'm like, hey, people, (laughs) I'm retweeting this over here. I'm trying to get on. But I'm just, you know, and especially somebody like myself, who's been in the business so long, seen so many ladies um, pass away from mental health issues in this business, um, to now to see that there's so many resources that are available that were never available to any of us before. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how I much promote that, you know, and yeah. I just feel like a lot of um, ladies within the business might be ashamed or think they're too cool or whatever it is. So I feel like those of us that are older that think we're still cool, (laughs) like talk about it, like let them know, like, you know, I'm doing it too. Like it's okay. And I feel like there's a lot more ladies 
that are really vocal about, you know, being sober and things like that within the business too. And, um, you know, to me, it's all just a way to be a healthier, safer community. Yeah. It's really incredible. Um, I've been in the industry 22 years now yeah. and then obviously kind of grew up around it because of my yes. parents. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you'd almost say I've been in it my whole life Yes. and, and to see the way that it's changed and the resources that have come up and the outreach and the advocacy. And I mean, it's, it's kind of incredible. And I know that, you know, we're still fraught with a lot of problems and issues, right. but but compared to the way that it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, like, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like these, you know, like the younger generation, I'm like, this is like the Tell best time. Yeah, yeah exactly. this is like the best time to be in porn it than really it ever was. When there was issues when I was younger in like the supposed golden era, right? If you had somebody rape you on set, nothing happened. Nothing. The Nothing. only way that anything ever happens is now when a girl po posted on Twitter that's got a lot of followers. That has allowed performers to have a voice that was never existent before. And when someone's got a couple of million followers on Twitter, that's a big voice that bitch has got, you know? And people have to listen, which that, that kind of power didn't exist before. And I'm just, I'm so happy. Like recently, I've been seeing new consent uh, regulations that have been coming out that I'm like ecstatic about. I just worked with um, MILF VR and they did the whole from A to Z. And I'm like, oh my God, it like gave me goosebumps. It made me like so happy, you know? Um, and yeah, there's, you know, like the new consent stuff is really cool. And then it's funny because as I was working on, you know, some of the swap uh, Las Vegas stuff, um, I was talking to, I believe her name, oh God, I hope she's not going to kill me, Daisy Ducati. And um, so I was talking to her because she lives here in Vegas about, um, you know, perhaps helping. And she had reached out to me that she was interested. And so she's also part of uh, BIPOC. And she was telling me all these amazing things about BIPOC. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, I, I know about it. You know, my I have a girlfriend that, you know, is always tweeting about everything and I'm always like helping retweet it. And I was like, who's running that? And she's like, Cinnamon Love. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Me and that bitch go way back. <laughs> we got history, you know, and, uh, and we do. And we've known each other. We're close friends. And, um, you know, I called her up and we had like a three hour conversation, one old bitch to another. She might not appreciate me calling her that. Sorry, boo. Um, but, you know, two sisters that have known each other for a long time that are in a place in our lives of where we want to like give back. And, you know, at one point she didn't like me all that much. And uh, it was my fault. I did it. I'll own up to it. Um, and um you know, and even at that point in time, I always recommended her for jobs, even when I knew she was hating on me, because she's so smart and so intelligent. And, you know, I've always um, really respected her uh, as as a peer, uh, as a woman, um, as a warrior. And, um, you know, I really think she's just doing an amazing job over there. So kudos to her. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's and been, the it's entire been... group because it's not just her. Obviously, there's a lot of people. Yeah. She's the only one that I I know, and I know that she has her hand in a lot of different things over there. But I, you know, I see all of the events and things that they're doing, and I'm like, yes, this is just. And it came out of nowhere with Black Lives Matter, you know, just within the last couple of months, and they are up and on their feet and going and just doing really amazing workshops and events. I've signed up to the, I think it's called Horoween. And they've got the politics ones where they're talking about sex workers and pol politics. They've got really great speakers. I mean, they're just doing some amazing things. I'm just, like so impressed. Yeah, it's really an amazing time. And kind of going back a little bit to what you were saying about, you know, girls going on Twitter and consent and calling people out and how it's so different than it was before. Yeah. I think also too, what helps is these personal content platforms like OnlyFans where girls feel financially independent and in a place where they feel like they can speak out because they're not worried about getting blacklisted. Get blacklisted. Yeah. They're not worried about losing jobs. They don't 
their livelihood no longer necessarily depends on like being hired by the bigger brands. And I think that that's put so much more power back into the hands of the performers that have allowed for, you know, their voices to flourish in this way. And it's just been like, it's been amazing to see, I think for someone like you and for me, yeah. who've been in this industry for yeah. so long, to see the way that it's changing right now, it's just like this, it's this incredible, incredible. moment. It really yeah. is because for a, a business and an industry that I do love so much, there's also shit that I don't agree with. Of course. <laughs> I'm not going to be that person where you interview and it's like, I'm just going to follow the sheep. I'm all, yeah, I, everything's I pay, perfect. Exactly. I pay my own damn taxes and I have been for a long time and I got my own opinion. <laughs> you know, yeah. and my opinion is not exactly what everybody thinks it's always going to be because a lot of times I talk shit about the industry. I love it, but it's not perfect, you know. And some of these places where it's not perfect, these this light is being shed on it. And because of that, we're able to go into the dark, bring some light to it, and change some of these dark places to make it safer and healthier for the entire business, which I just never thought I'd ever I really never thought I'd ever see that I was like yeah yeah right (laughs) jaded old bitch right here I'm like yeah right yeah it's never gonna happen and shit it's happening and I'm just I'm I'm glad I was wrong let me put it that way right yeah yeah no you're you're right um and I think you know it's important not to gloss over everything and to claim that you know, to try to pretend like the porn industry doesn't have its pitfalls and right. like you said, dark spaces, because if we ignore that, then how can we change it? So exactly. And I think before it's important to we, talk we, about all that. Yeah. And I think before with, with no way to really shed light on it, those dark spaces just existed and we all had to mm-hmm. look the other way. We couldn't mm-hmm. ever do anything about it except Mm -hmm. maybe tell a girl don't work with this person or something like that. I mean, that was the only thing that we could do. There wasn't any real change where now there's real change that's happening. And I know some people that are predatory probably don't like it, but you know, for those of us that um, love this business and want to see people healthy um, that are going through it and having long flourishing careers, I think it's just, it's the, it's the bee's knees. I'm so happy about it. So I want to uh, go back and, and talk a little bit more about something else that you mentioned, sure. um, because I know this is a a very interesting subject to a lot of people, especially men, but it's something that they don't necessarily want to talk about. And that is pegging. Um, hey, so talk about it. yeah, tell me about how you like got into pegging why you enjoy it, how you see your scene partners that you work in. Is it always an emasculating experience? Could you be a power bottom as a man being pegged? Um, all that. Okay. So mistress mommy is in the, ha- in the house now. So um, I hate the word pegging. I don't know who came up with that, but oh my God. <sighs> I just can't stand that word. Anywho, um, female to male strap on. <laughs> okay. We'll call it that. That's fine. <laughs> oh, good. I love the title though. Pioneer of pegging. Um, <laughs> so I was a sick and twisted bitch from an early age. I had like a hot pink mohawk, you know, up to here with Batman blue Doc Martens. I used to like write fuck you on the side of my head with, you know, eyeliner. And um, me and my girlfriend used to go to Ace Hardware and we would get like these long chains and then we would make like, uh, cause we were punk rock bitches and then we would make belts out of these chains and then we would drink Jägermeister because I did already say that I'm sober because <clears throat> I started a little early and, uh, I would just start beating the shit out of dudes, man. And so I don't know like where it came from. I had a water bed, and for those of y'all that don't know what a water bed is, because you're too young, um, there used to be these- water things. beds were a big thing for a Dude, hot minute. I know. <laughs> if you had a water bed, you were like water next level. Oh man, exactly. <laughs> I had a water bed, and um, you know, when I had my whole room painted black with like, um, blo- I had black lights in my room, and you know, anyways, yeah, so. I had the waterbed and as part of the waterbed, they had drawers on the bottom of it. Right. And so I had started taking 
um, electrical cords and cutting them and tying guys up to the bed. So, because it was like so easy. And I don't know where, I, sw- I have no idea. I didn't see, I don't remember seeing anything. I did like the movie Videodrome, which is a Cronenberg film that had um, Blondie in it and James Wood. And it had some weird twisted kind of stuff in it. And I think that that definitely affected my sexuality. Like a lot of the Cronenberg films did. Um, and so, but anywho, that's the only thing I can remember that was like any kind of BDSM bondage kind of thing. But so I used to steal these like fluorescent light bulbs from the hallways from where I lived at. And I don't know what got into me, but you know where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> Put it in I'm a guy's scared. ass. Yeah. Every time I go to Home Depot and I walk down that aisle, I'm like, oh, thank you, Mother Goddess <laughs> Shay, that nobody ever got hurt. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't even know if they had strap-ons back then, you know. And um, apparently, yeah. I actually I interviewed a professor, and apparently, yes. strap-ons have been around since the medieval times. What really? Oh yeah, my God, yeah. They found like old, like literally strap-ons from like wow. the 1300s or something wow, like that. Wow, so, that's so amazing! So wow. A bit of trivia for you. Go back and watch my interview with. Uh, Dr. Yanega. Um, oh, absolutely. That sounds and interesting. We, we talk all about that medieval <laughs> dildos. I want so, to throw that in there. But yeah, I, I, you know, I lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I had no idea about no harnesses of any sort. And uh, so, and it's funny too, because the guy that I first did it to, like I ended up reconnecting with him. 20 years later on Facebook. And I'm like, dude, I've done so many interviews where I talked about like the first person. He's like, oh my God, you didn't say my name. I'm like, no, of course I didn't say your name. And then he like unfriended me. (laughs) (laughs) Which I kind of wonder if he still kind of watches everything just to make sure that I don't say his name. But yeah, Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, there was somebody that I I remember distinctly was the first person I stuck a light bulb in his ass. And, you know, and it was kind of like et phone home it's always been like that is home i must go home (laughs) i love that ass i'm telling you so for me it definitely is um a, a power thing you know it's funny because like you know i go on some of these sets with girls that are doing strap on scenes and i'm like what the fuck are you doing that's not how you fuck a bitch like you take control of that motherfucker and you just fuck him. Like you fuck him, fuck him, <laughs> you know? And they're all like, do, do, do. and I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how you do this. I was funny because I was doing a scene with a girl and as part of being an old bitch, one of the rites of passage is back surgery. So I had back surgery earlier this year. And, uh, and for those of you that have had back surgery, you're going to want to know what kind I had a posterior lumbar injury body fusion, the L5 S1 and the laminectomy, but moving on. So I was working with Lance Hart, uh, for sweet femdom, you know, here in Las Vegas. And of course he didn't want to push me more than what was necessary. And I still wasn't sure it was the first shoot that I had done. And it was before COVID. Because he's very, co- he's on top of everything with COVID because he's on the board of directors with the Free Speech Coalition. Um, so this was before COVID and um, I was working with a girl and I didn't know what my capabilities were at that time either. And she was doing that. <laughs> and I, I started getting behind her, right? Like, fuck that bitch, fuck him, right? And you could see Lance like off to the side, like, oh Lord, okay, yeah. And uh, and then it was kind of cute because later on the two of us were doing a scene and then I could see she was like, trying to get in there, just fuck that ass, you know? I was like, yeah, that's how you do it, man. <laughs> it's like not that, it's not that easy, right? There's like a certain like hip motion, like angle. To me, it's all about grabbing the bitch. Like a do. lot of it is like, part of like this arm like grab that fucking bitch and fuck him you know like you gotta yeah. get in there and fuck a bitch right. <laughs> yeah. I mean... that's why i love working with um uh lexi sindel uh at uh femdom empire like there's a scene that i did with her and she had the guy all dressed in latex in a gimp suit and she kind of had given me a handle on his back and a huge freaking strap on right and this bitch could take it too it's tony tony orlando he's such a little whore and um and so you know i i just i was 
fuck, I fucked that bitch up like properly. Like I gave him a good, I mean, that was the best fucking I've ever had because I had that handle to just drill into that bitch, you know? So you can tell I get into it. <laughs> yeah. I'm passionate about the ass fucking. If you're going to do it, do it right. I believe that about everything in life. <laughs> oh my god so yes if you're looking for like a super essential like ooh, kind of strap on scene i'm not your bitch but if you're looking yeah. like you know to have a, a female you know a dominant female take a bitch down i'm the one so yeah, so your scenes are definitely more like the aggressive power yes. top type yes. scenes. Yeah, because that's and, who I am. Yeah, yeah, and there's different kinds of of pegging scenes. I had Michael Vegas on, and he, uh, you know, had some interesting things to say about being like a power bottom in yeah. those in those types of scenes too. And I didn't realize that there were all these kind of different ways that you could right. shoot a pegging scene. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I, I don't want to work with a power bottom. Like, you need to be, yeah. like, get down there and do your job. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, everybody's got their style, and that's your style, and you own it. And him will work together. He actually, you know, I know him through uh, Suzy Q, and, um, and we've had a couple of different um, business interactions. And, you know, being the pioneer of pegging and being he is who he is. Nobody has paired us together yet. And it's like, what? One day it's going to happen, though. And it's going to be it, fucking amazing. The universe just might explode. I don't know. I'm Maybe people you, are, <laughs> are too afraid. <laughs> I am looking oh my forward God. to the day that it happens. I think it'll be amazing. Yeah. Because <laughs> I well, know he wants this cock. Yeah. he's. It's amazing what that guy can take. And I love uh, his well, uh, significant other, too. She's so beyond amazing. I was on there. Yeah. I was on her thing yesterday. What was it for? Uh, it was shooting on a budget or something that she was doing. It was like a Zoom mm. thing. And I was on that yesterday and she did a, an amazing job of moderating it. I really adore her. Yeah, she's a really intelligent woman. And if you guys want to get to know her better, I have also had her on my podcast. <laughs> and you can go back and watch our interview together or listen to it if you're on the audio platforms. Um, Brittany, thank you so much. This was an amazing interview. I know we could go on and on. There's so much more to talk about, but we are going to do a bonus Q and a segment for my Patreon members. I have a bunch of questions for you that, um, my supporters have asked. So it is not over yet, but we are done here for this full version of the podcast. But if you want to check out the bonus Q and a, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. And you can learn more about Brittany Andrews there. So Brittany, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media and also any websites that you might want to plug? Sure. Yeah, I guess the best is all my links. And I go by DJ Britstar. So DJ B-R-I-T-S-T-A-R. And that's my Twitter handle. That's my um, Instagram handle. So just head over to all my links for DJ Britstar. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. And of course, um, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filter Like I just mentioned to watch this bonus Q and a that we're about to do plus ones on so many other of your favorite stars. And also, uh, go to Holly Randall and and sign up for our newsletter. We only send it out once a month, so we will not spam you, but it's a great way to keep up on the latest with my podcast and just all the other things that are going on with my life. So thank you so much for listening or watching wherever you are. And again, Brittany, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Namaste. And Namaste. Namaste. Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that will not only not nick or snag your nuts, but can also be used on your chest hair. If you get it in the Perfect Package 3.0, it will come with a bunch of liquid formulas to keep you feeling and smelling fresh all day. And for a limited time, you can also get a free travel bag and anti-chafing boxer briefs that come with it. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping.